Good afternoon. I'm pleased to declare the 2010 commencement for the Quinnipiac University School of Law officially open. Would you please remain standing for the invocation, which will be delivered by Rena Judd, University Rabbi. Soon, very soon, you will step into the lives you have hereby been preparing for. May the tools you have acquired, the knowledge and wisdom, the understanding, the empathy, and the enlightenment you have gained enable you to better the world person by person, elevating the status of us all with that which is good and holy. Please be seated. I'd like to take a moment to recognize the members of our platform party, which consists of our honorary degree recipients, whom you'll meet in a few moments, university administrators, and the deans and faculty of the School of Law. It's now my pleasure to introduce Brad Saxton, Dean of the School of Law. Good afternoon, everybody. It's wonderful to welcome you here for this celebration of our graduates. Graduates, welcome. Um, it's my privilege and honor at this time to introduce Dr. John Leahy, the president of the university, who will extend greetings on behalf of the university. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to all of, a, all of you on this wonderful day of joy and celebration. To our law school graduates, I want to extend my heartiest congratulations to each and every one of you. You should all feel very proud of your accomplishments and the well-deserved recognition you are receiving today. Two of today's graduates, James Belforti and Kara Hinesley, were members of the team that took first place out of 22 teams after preliminary rounds in a national trial competition sponsored by the Texas Young Lawyers Association. James went on to win the Best Advocate Award in his team's final trial. Kara also was integral to the success of Quinnipiac Law teams that she coached for another competition in March, the ABA's Representation in Mediation Competition. Quinnipiac's teams went on to take first and second place. Another of today's graduates, Erica Tyler, is this year's winner of the prestigious Clinical Legal Education Award for her outstanding work through our legal clinic. I also want to recognize your Student Bar Association president, Keith Zakowitz, who provided outstanding leadership this past year, so much so that Dean Saxon awarded Keith a Dean's Award for his exceptional dedication. The Quinnipiac University School of Law is advancing both in terms of academic quality and national recognition. These achievements are clearly a consequence of the exceptional work of our law faculty and the excellent leadership of Dean Brad Saxon and our Dean of Admissions, Ed Wilkes. In the final analysis, though, a law school, like any other school, will be judged best by its graduates. And so, members of the class of 2010, we are depending on you to make the best use possible of the education you had received at the Quinnipiac University School of Law. You have already left a significant mark on our School of Law, and I have no doubt that you will leave an even greater mark on the world that awaits you. Again, my congratulations and best wishes to each and every one of you. Thank you, President Leahy. Uh, welcome again to graduating students to family members, to friends, uh, to guests of our graduates, and to the other guests that who joined us for the celebration. And thank you, President Leahy, for, on behalf of the Law School for the university's support. We are very, very grateful and always appreciative. On behalf of the faculty and administration of the Law School, let me congratulate you guys. We are really proud of you. We appreciate all your hard work, and we are so optimistic about the contribution that you will be making in this profession. Uh, also wanted to take this opportunity to talk offer special thanks from all of us. Some of our graduates go through law school mostly by themselves, but many more of them go through it with tremendous support from family members, uh, from 
significant others, children, spouses, parents. Um, I'd like to take this opportunity to allow the graduates to thank those back there in the crowd who are um, supporters and who have really helped our folks get through this, and especially on this Mother's Day, thanks to all the mothers out there. So. This is for me a, a unique opportunity. It's the last time probably that I will get to address you all as a group. Um, the last time I got to do that was orientation day, which really didn't seem like a very long time ago to me. I don't know about to you, and I'll come back to that in a moment. But as I was thinking what, about what I'd like to discuss with you in the brief time I have here, I had a special opportunity last weekend because I attended my 25th reunion um, from my law school down in Charlottesville. Um, my wife went down with me and we spent a long weekend. And I had a lot of opportunities last week to talk to old friends and reminisce and, and hear how their lives have gone. And I, three key insights, I think, um, came out of that weekend for me that I wanted to share with you. The, the first one, man, that went fast. Um, it, I, I don't know how it felt for you. I've talked to a number of you as you're graduating and a number of you have said, um, looking back on it, you have simultaneously two feelings which would seem to be conflicting. It seemed to be an awful lot of stuff you went through and it took a really long time, but it also seems like yesterday that you were here for your first day of law school and it went very fast. For me and for many of my classmates um, at Virginia, as we reminisced last weekend, it was exactly the same feeling. 25 years, an awful lot happened. It seemed to take a long time, but it also went like that. Really, really fast. Second insight, I was very interested to see how few of the classmates that I got to talk to there are still doing what they started doing just when they left law school. Um, maybe three or four people out of probably 50 or 60 people that I visited with are still in the same position that they took in their first year out of law school or their second year out of law school. The vast majority of them have gone a bunch of different paths, sort of a winding path and ended up where they are now. Um, and that led to the third insight which really interested me, which was trying to sort of glean from these different conversations who seemed happiest and who seemed most fulfilled of these old friends in the last 25 years. And listening to a bunch of conversations that went in similar ways, things that left out, relationships. What, what did the people talk about who seemed happy and fulfilled? A lot of them talked about their relationships, their parents, their children, their spouses, their significant others, their partners, and the joy that they have taken in these 25 years and the time spent with loved ones. Leisure, exercise, travel, entertainment, reading, personal growth, a lot of them talked about that when they talked about what it was that had made them feel happy and fulfilled. Service, service to their communities, service in the bar, service to religious organizations to which they belonged, um, pro bono work. A lot of them talked about that with great joy and pride. And they talked about their work. Um, some of them who seemed really happy said, I love my job. Um, maybe not a whole lot of them said, I love my job, but a lot of them did. And the vast majority of those who seemed happy and fulfilled at least said, I like my job. I like it quite a bit. Um, the few people who said, I hate my job, or I really don't like my job, were the least happy folks I saw there. And that has been true throughout my professional life. I think it's very hard for people to feel happy and fulfilled in their lives if they're saying, I just don't like my job, or I don't like my work, or I hate my job. So are there lessons um, in that? Well, what I saw among my classmates and what I hope for you is that I saw classmates who made choices over the 25 years since we graduated. People who thought hard about what it was that was most important to them, their relationships, service, um, leisure time, balance, and the kind of work that they did. And like many of you, some of you will 25 years from now at your own reunion will be in the same job that you're taking right as you leave us. Many more of you probably will have taken different jobs and different paths along the way. Um, so I'm challenging you right now. What I'd like you to do is envision yourself 25 years from now, because it's gonna go like that, even though it's gonna take a long time to get there. What are you gonna be telling us at your 25th reunion? You'll show up and Sandy Mickeljohn will still be teaching contracts and real estate transactions and commercial law. Um, 
our hope for you is that you will be coming there and saying, I really like what I've made of these last 25 years. And when we say to you, what is it that made you happy? What is it that made you fulfilled? I'm hoping you will say, I really thought about the things that were important to me and I made choices along the way. Um, if I realized that the work that I was doing is not what I wanted to do for the rest of my career, I figured out how to make those transitions so that I would value my work, that I would like my work, hopefully that I would love my work, that I would also balance it with these other things that make my life meaningful. That's my hope for you, my fervent hope for you. So um, with that, I do want to say again, congratulations to all of you. Um, I would like to close with a request. Um, please keep in mind that from our perspective, this is not the end of our commitment to you. Um, keep in touch with us. Let us know how we can help you in the path that you'll be weaving over the next while. If we can be helpful, we will. Call up your old professor friends. Call me. Ask us for advice. Ask us for help as you're trying to sort this through. And we are here to help you. We will miss you. We are fond of you. So congratulations. try and get my script collected here. At this time, it is my honor to invite Judge Samuel Friedman, Professor Kerry Cass, uh, Mark Thompson, whom you've already met, and President Leahy to come forward. Samuel S. Friedman, you have served all three branches of government during a career that spans 54 years and continues today. In your 32 years on the Connecticut Superior Court, you have earned a reputation as an expert in the trial of homicide cases, presiding over some 52 of them. In 1997, you were appointed a judge trial referee. In honor of your service, your portrait hangs in the main criminal courtroom at the Stamford Courthouse and is the last thing the prisoners on their way to jail get to see. <laughs> After earning your degree from Yale Law School, you became a partner at Friedman Peck and Friedman. You practiced law for 25 years, including service as a special public defender for Fairfield County. In 1972, you were elected to Connecticut's House of Representatives, where you chaired the Ju Judiciary Committee Subcommittee on Criminal Justice. You also wrote the bill that created our state's public defender system. The legislature appointed you its chief legal counsel in 1975, and you also chaired the governor's task force on deinstitutionalizing people with developmental disabilities. You have shared your wisdom with rising lawyers teaching the legislative externship course and classes on legislation and trial practice at Quinnipiac University School of Law for many years. Many of your students have gone on to careers in public service because of your influence. In consideration of your illustrious legal career and your many contributions to the state of Connecticut, Quinnipiac University School of Law is pleased and honored to present you with the honorary degree of Doctor of Laws on this ninth day of May, 2010. By the power vested in me by the Board of Trustees, I hereby confer upon you the degree of Doctor of Laws Honoris Causa with all the rights and privileges pertaining thereto. Congratulations. I can't help thinking about a time when I was a young boy. My father, who was a very wise man, said to me, when people say nice things about you, keep your mouth shut. <laughs> My sincerest thanks to both the university and the law school for the honor you have given me today. I've taught at this law school for 27 years, over a quarter century, and I can honestly tell you that I have enjoyed every day of it. 
the administration and the faculty have encouraged fresh thinking in the classroom. They have set a tone that had literally made it a pleasure to teach here. Those of you who are graduating must surely know that this school cares very deeply about you. Occasionally people say to me, this is an up and coming law school, isn't it? And I always tell them the same thing, we're already up there. We're just waiting for our reputation to match reality. When you start to practice your chosen profession, you're going to find that the courtroom is a very dignified place, despite the conflict it contains. You're also going to find out that good character counts and counts heavily in that courtroom. If you remember that, you will be able to leave the courtroom the way you find it. The faculty of this school has given you tools for the future. Use them wisely. Every one of you has it within you to do good things for this world. Now it's time for you to go out and make us proud of you. Thank you. Thank you, Judge Friedman, and thank you for all your many years of service to the state and to the law school. We're very grateful. This time I would like to invite Chief Justice Rogers, uh, Professor Jeff Cooper, Mark Thompson, and Professor, uh, President Leahy again to come forward. Chase T. Rogers, during your 12 years on the bench, you've impressed attorneys, the parties they represent, and the public with your competence, your fairness, and your wisdom. Since 2007, you have served as Chief Justice of the Connecticut Supreme Court, only the second woman in this state to hold that position. You preside over the state's judicial branch with its workforce of 4,000. You have been an articulate spokesperson and strong advocate for transparency and trust. Among your priorities are increasing diversity within the branch and enhancing the mentoring program for new judges. You began your legal career at Cummings and Lockwood, where you concentrated in commercial and employment litigation and were made a partner. In 1998, you were nominated to the Connecticut Superior Court, and in 2006, its appellate's court. Although it is early in your tenure as Chief Justice, you have demonstrated that you care deeply about the next generation of lawyers. We appreciate your service as a judge in the law school's moot court competition and your inclusion of representatives from Quinnipiac University School of Law on the committee that examines judicial internships around the state. We are also grateful for your leadership in hosting a recent gathering of law school deans to explore how the court might better partner with law schools to enhance professionalism. In recognition of your distinguished career and your ardent devotion to justice, the Quinnipiac University School of Law is pleased to confer upon you the honorary degree of Doctor of Laws this ninth day of May, 2010. By the power vested in me by the Board of Trustees, I hereby confer upon you the degree of Doctor of Laws Honoris Causa with all the rights and privileges pertaining thereto. Congratulations.
Chief Justice Rogers, we are so honored to have you with us today. Um, I do a lot of work around the state with uh, different bar organizations, with members of the bar. And I, one of our reasons for being so pleased to have you here is that you have provided such outstanding leadership. Um, in, in a short time already as Chief Justice, you've made an extraordinary difference. And you hear that all around the state um, in terms of the different things that our, our commencement speaker today has, has really prompted and is encouraging um, throughout the state. I'm especially grateful for the role model that you serve as for our graduating students in terms of your professionalism, your choices to serve, and your wisdom. So welcome and thank you for joining us and we await your remarks. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Um, President John Leahy, Dean Brad Saxton, Associate Dean David King, the Honorable Sam Friedman, distinguished members of the Quinnipiac, Quinnipiac Law School's faculty, special guests, students, and family. I want to start by recognizing Judge Friedman, who's being honored today. I have had the privilege to work with him for the last decade, and I can tell you he is all the public can expect in a judge. He is an excellent listener, compassionate, practical, and well-deserving of your recognition. Um, turning to our other attendees, it is certainly an honor to be here today to join in congratulating the graduates and their families. To the graduates, you have spent many long days and nights reading books, taking tests, and wondering whether you would ever get to see this day. Well, in case you are still wondering whether this is all really happening, let me assure you that you have in fact made it. It's also important to take time to thank your families, and I will echo what Dean Saxton said. When we define success, it's often using the singular person. He graduated with honors, she made the dean's list. And I would suggest to you, however, that success is plural, in that you achieved your goals not only because of what you did, but also because of the support you received over the years from families and friends who believed in your dream. It seems especially fitting today on Mother's Day to take a moment to recognize your family members. Let me assure you as, you, as new law school graduates, that there are silver linings in the dark economic clouds that hover. I don't think I have to remind you that these are uncertain times to enter the workforce. I'm sure it's highly unlikely that anybody sitting here today doesn't know people who have had their lives turned upside down because of the recession. The evidence is also in our courtrooms, where our judiciary faces the daunting task of dealing with all of these problems, issues made all the more difficult because of the budgetary crisis. Yet the needs of the people we serve has grown as well. In other words, we may have fewer resources to do what we need to do, but there is no corresponding decrease in the number of people who seek redress from our courts. This trend actually has significant implications for you. Practically speaking, we all know that it may be more difficult than it was several years ago to get your first job. However, I would urge you to do the following. Use the same common sense, energy, and talent that got you through law school. Opportunities do exist, though you may need to strive harder, look wider, and rely on a heavy dose of patience. Above all, don't be discouraged by circumstances outside of your control. Instead, you need to take charge, keep moving forward, and realize that the current economic situation may actually provide you with some wonderful opportunities. And I don't think I'm being too dramatic when I say, people need help, and you can provide it to them now. Let me say up front that the business of law has changed dramatically since I sat in your seat. But one of the biggest changes you will encounter is that more people are representing themselves in court. You need to both recognize and understand what this means for the profession of law, because make no mistake about it, this phenomenon will be part of your legal landscape. Consider, if you will, the following numbers. The number of self-represented parties in family cases in Connecticut has grown exponentially. Today, an estimated 80.5% of family cases in our state courts have at least one party who is being self-represented. For those of us within the system, we know family cases always have drawn um, self-represented litigants. So here's another statistic for you to consider. 
In 2005, there were 12,356 self-represented parties in civil cases. Four years later, it reached 26,252. I'm not very good at math, but for an astounding 112% increase. What this means is that 23% of the civil cases in our state courts currently have at least one self-represented party. What this means for you is simple. It's not good enough anymore to just put attorney before your name, hang out a shingle, and head off to court. You are going to have to up your game right from the very beginning in order to persuade people that they need you as their attorney. You are going to need to distinguish yourself by caring about your client, about our system of justice, about doing the right thing. It will all be about developing a reputation from the beginning for civility and grace under pressure, and for treating opposing counsel, the courts, and your clients with respect and dignity. Having been on both sides of the bench, let me assure you that the best lawyers in this state have very common qualities. They are compassionate, courteous, and extremely well prepared in the practice of law. And I know you're sitting here now getting very nervous, but these are qualities you can exhibit from the moment you start practicing. In fact, we have had an attorney who just recently began practicing law appear in the Supreme Court at least three and I think four times this year, which is highly unusual. And regardless of whether we agreed with his position, all of the justices have commented repeatedly on his unfailing professionalism towards opposing counsel in the court and his calm and extremely well thought out presentation. I suggest to you that this is the type of lawyer who should be your model. You may be asking, how do I start to get re real legal experience once I pass the bar? And the answer is, there has never been a more critical time for caring and competent attorneys. And given the difficult times in which we live, there has never been a more critical time to step up to the plate and do pro bono work. My colleague, Justice Peter Zarella, put it this way so eloquently when he spoke at a swearing in of attorneys last year. He said, pro bono service to people in need is the payment you make for the honor of being an attorney. Connecticut's rule of professional conduct recognizes this responsibility in Rule 6.1, which reads, a lawyer should render public interest legal service. A lawyer may discharge this responsibility by providing professional services at no fee or a reduced fee to persons of limited means or to public service or charitable groups or organizations. You might have noticed that the first line doesn't say a lawyer may render public interest legal service. It says should, and I don't think it gets much clearer than that. But doing pro bono work is, is not just about helping someone because a rule says that you should. It's about doing something because through your education and experience, you are in a unique position to help someone get through an extremely difficult situation. Perhaps someone is in the process of losing their, losing their home through foreclosure or having their visitation rights reduced or at risk of losing their veterans' benefits. In all of these situations, you have the opportunity to donate a small amount of your time to somebody who may well reap the benefits of your kindness and your expertise for the rest of their life. There are multiple ways you can do pro bono work. For example, you might consider contacting the Connecticut Pro, bon pro Bono Network. This was established in 1991 between Connecticut's legal service agencies and the Connecticut Bar Association and it recruits attorneys and paralegal volunteers to provide legal representation for low-income clients involved in civil cases. Just a few of the agencies and programs that have been involved are statewide legal services, the AIDS Legal Network, Lawyers for Children America, Connecticut Lawyers Legal Aid to the Elderly, the Connecticut Fair Housing Center, Lawyers Without Borders, and Truancy Intervention Project, and the Connecticut Veterans Legal Center. As you can see, Finding an organization to match your interests would not be difficult, and it's a fantastic way to get real legal experience. <clears throat> and you will be in good company. More than 4,000 volunteers and paralegals already are involved in the network, and approximately 800 volunteers provide free legal assistance to low-income individuals through the network every single year. You might also find opportunities for pro bono work th through the Connecticut Judicial Branch. For example, we've just instituted a pilot volunteer program in the Hartford Judicial Family Court. 22 attorneys have signed up since the program started on this last February. And as of the end of April, these volunteers had assisted approximately 120 self-represented parties in the area of family law. Not surprisingly, I can report to you that the response of the litigants has been overwhelmingly positive. 
The bottom line is the courts, the bar, and you, the fu as future attorneys, all must work together to provide the best access that we can to our court system. And in today's climate, that means not only fully representing those who can pay, but also assisting those who cannot. I would add that the significance of providing access to justice goes far beyond practicalities. For if people lose faith in their court's ability to make sure that justice is done, they lose faith in the rule of law and our system of laws. It's not a leap to say that access goes to the heart of a democratic society and that erosion of any kind must be stopped. The stakes are that high, so are the rewards. And I believe there has never been a more exciting time to join this honorable and immensely satisfying profession because the opportunities to make a meaningful difference in someone's lives have never been greater. And I promise you one thing, that you will remember far more vividly the day you represented a child in a, in a neglect and abuse proceeding or assisted a parent trying to save her or her, his home from foreclosure much more than the time when you wrote a contract or participated in a real estate closing. In other words, you can make a living and help those that are less fortunate than you. Along the way, you will become a better, more empathetic lawyer who is a credit to your colleagues, your profession, and to the people who are with you today to celebrate your achievement. I want to thank you again for your kind invitation to speak here today. It's an honor, and please enjoy the rest of the day with your family and friends, and I congratulate you and wish you all the best for the future. Thank you, Chief Justice Rogers. This time it is my privilege and pleasure to introduce Associate Dean David King, who will introduce the graduating class. Good afternoon. The graduating class has selected as hooders Professors Mary Ferrari, Jeffrey Meyer, and the Professor of the Year, William Dunlap. Will you please come forward? Will the marshals please bring the graduates forward? Ladies and gentlemen, it is my honor and privilege to present to you the individual members of the class of 2010. Keith Zakowitz. Colleen Grace Kozik. Shannon Lee Mori. Christina M. Watkins. Catherine May Boucher. Michael J. Riley. Brandon Shane Jean. Edward Lee Miller. Paul Robert Geary. Abraham L. Hurdle. Jason Michael Maurer. Mirza Rafai Arafin. Semi Candle. Austin Barisic Johns. 
James Michael Belforti. Alex A. Romano. Jeffrey P. Nichols. Eric Villanova. Ryan Joseph Flanagan. Thomas Lavalli. Amer Adnan Ahmed. Brian D. Festa. Alexandra Marie Wilson. Stephanie Maria Kazakowski. Aaron Elizabeth Regan. Elena C. Judge. Rosanna Renzoni Rogers. Sherry Debiden. Joseph Abraham. Rachel Ann Castagnoli. Stephanie Waysom Ma. Adam R. Shibley. <clears throat> Catherine Aaron Boucher. Zachary I. Goldsmith. Kristen A. Dufour. Kara Nicole Hinesley. <laughs> Kelly A. O'Brien. <laughs> Corinne Marie Abbott. <laughs> Kristen Stumpo. Lauren Ashley Ross. Denise A. Mortati. Lisa Carolyn Dumond. Donald Lester Nevins III. Sophia Zarina Johansson Ligari. <laughs> Ashley Elizabeth Doherty. <laughs> Allison Weiner Magus. <clears throat> Lawrence Joseph Cohen. Adrian Elizabeth Roach. Sarah Elizabeth Frankel. Brittany Taylor Sanders. Kristen Eve Boyle. 
Bindi K. Desai. Shalimar Kelly. Allison Lynn Slater. Brian F. Valco. Michael Bruno Guarco III. Naomi Phillip. Sikristal Obianuju Umego. Jane Elaine Ballerini. Erica Tyler. William Charles Sherman. Stephen J. Tatey. Karen Donnelly. Ashley Rose Adams. Rachel Elizabeth Payne. Nathan Gregory Rawling. Caitlin Elizabeth Fleming. Stephanie Rose Newell. David J. Vandrilla. Julie Faye Mena. Jacqueline Elizabeth Fusco. Tamara Hannah Sager. Alyssa V. Sheriff. Jessica Lynn Johnson. Alicia S. D'Souza Rocha. Danielle Robinson Briand. Diana M. Gomez. Joshua Pedrera. Sean E. Boyd. Mary Catherine Gamble. Alexander Saras. Christopher M. Brine. Nicholas Robert Mancini. Brian C. McDermott. Jessica M. Hodges. Natasha Jane Rabinovich. Benjamin M. Shapiro. Zachary Ryland. 
Richard E. Fennelly III. Alex John Ricciardone. Nathan Ryan Walker. Nathan J. Buchak. Christopher S. Grollo. William Gregory Brown. Peter Walter Pavasaris. And to be hooded by his father, John Davenport, class of 1988, William J. Davenport. Will the class please rise? Mr. President, it is my privilege to present to you the Quinnipiac University School of Law Class of 2010. By the power vested in me by the Board of Trustees, I hereby confer upon you the degree of Juris Doctor with all the rights and privileges pertaining thereto. Congratulations to all of you. Congratulations. Please be seated. This time it's my honor to get to introduce Keith Zakowitz, the president of the Student Bar Association, and the, who will speak on behalf of the third year class, the graduating class. Congratulations. Thanks, friends. <laughs> President Leahy, Dean Saxton, distinguished faculty, deans, administration and staff, honored guests, friends and family, classmates of 2010. Before I address my friends and colleagues in the class of 2010, I'd, I'd like to take a moment to wish a happy Mother's Day to my mother, who's here somewhere, uh, to all the mothers that are in attendance. Hi, Mom. Uh, and also to my grandmother, who's actually at home watching via webcast. She's pretty savvy. Uh, I'd also like to wish a happy 25th birthday to my friend and fellow Car uh, graduate, Kara Hinesley. I'd finally like to express my sincere gratitude to my parents for their unwavering love and support to my girlfriend's father, Anthony, for his friendship and his frequent trips to BJ's, which have kept me nourished for the past three years. And to my girlfriend, Alyssa, who for the past nine and a half years has been my love and my partner in all of our endeavors. Friends, class of 2010, we've earned this day together. My friend Sam Candle said a few weeks ago that he considers himself fortunate 
for the opportunities that he's had to exchange thoughts and ideas with his friends and his colleagues here. Because it was these perspectives more than anything else that have made the law come to life. I too consider myself fortunate for those opportunities and for the friendships that I've forged these past three years. It's an honor as well as a daunting task to speak for this class, for this diverse and accomplished cl class. Law school prepared me for many things, but delivering a commencement address was certainly not one of them. I watched my good friend Kevin Cassini deliver this address last year, but if you know, if you know Kevin, you understand that I gained barely nothing from that. <laughs> so I, I sought the input of a few of my friends in writing this. I thought that may help, and in response, and in typical fashion, my response was met not with help, but with a challenge from Alex Romano to cleverly insert inside jokes into the speech. Ryan Flanagan, Jeff Nichols sent me YouTube videos of horrifying commencement speech fails. <laughs> and Candle, Sam Candle, perhaps the most diligent researcher this school has ever seen, sent me an appellate case, <laughs> which I grant you was incredibly entertaining and funny to read but should only be discussed in small private circles and is certainly not appropriate for this forum. <laughs> really appreciate the help, friends. As we become attorneys, we become the subject of many unfair lawyer jokes, though I will concede they may be fair with regard to a small percentage of lawyers. I suspect, however, that as graduates of 2010, we will perceive some of these jokes slightly differently than previous attorneys. For example, when most hear the slightly dark joke, what do you call a busload of lawyers going off a cliff? They think the punchline is a good start. But this year, class of 2010, we just think there may be a job opportunity. As graduates of the year 2010, we can't avoid the fact that we're entering the job market in a recession. For many of us, employment worries are compounded by enormous student loan debt. Reports for the past two years have made clear that in all likelihood, our lifestyles will not match at the first part of our career that enjoyed by Tom Cruise in the movie The Firm. And despite these sound bites and intimidating statistics, I'm confident that jobs will happen. What we face may be uncertain, but I submit to you that to view what we have done here and our future prospects in purely monetary terms would be a disservice to our accomplishments and a severe underestimation of our abilities, our drive, and our resourcefulness. We knew when we started law school that we weren't purchasing a savings bond. We will find or create opportunities for work, for helping individuals, for making positive change, and yes, to earn a living and to pay off our student loans. We will all weather the storm of a tough economy, the value of our degree is not found in its earning power, but in the opportunity that we now have to shape the world we live in. Over the course of the past three or four years, we've received a legal education of the highest quality, taught by professors whose dedication to this law school and its students makes this not just an institution of learning, but a community in which we've all played a role. From our very first day of orientation, back in the days of lobster and a skyrocketing housing market that just couldn't ever bust. I met many of the friends and colleagues who shaped this experience for me. I'd like to express my personal gratitude to all of the members of the law school community and take a moment to recognize just a few who I think serve as shining examples. Professor Farrell, honored this year by Irish American Magazine as one of the top 100 Irish American attorneys, not only taught us property, contracts, and equal protection, but also hosted students many times at his house for Irish dance and revelry. I never attended because I don't dance. <laughs> My fellow CUNY guy, he earned yet another degree this year, a master's degree in the classics from the CUNY Graduate Center in New York City. Professor Marsh, a former Manhattan District Attorney who hosts the ABA trial advocacy competition each year. And this year, with her assistance and that of my friend Kristen Dufour, we wrote an interesting and difficult fact pattern, hosted an incredible competition. Professor Krauss, 
who allowed us to base the murder suspect in that fact pattern off of his slightly offbeat character, and who, despite being one of the toughest graders in the school, is such an outstanding educator that I subjected myself to all four of the classes that he teaches. I'm not sure if you're applauding my self-deprecation. Professors Feigenson and Spiesel, who this year published their book Law on Display, and who are probably thinking right now that this speech would be aided very much by two screens just to my left and a well-laid-out PowerPoint, they would probably be right. Judge Friedman, whose major felony trial practice class and his legislation class both influenced me immensely and influenced me in my decision to pursue litigation. Politics is just not for everyone, Your Honor. Diane Bryant, whose title at this school should really be facilitator, and whose wit brought humor to many difficult administrative tasks. Professor Cass, whose compassion is contagious, and whose clinics and externships gave many of us real-world experience and opportunity to find our path in the legal world. Dean Saxton, who many were lucky enough to have as a professor, but, over the past, but who I have come to know as a tremendous leader, a mentor, and a friend. And finally, to Judge jo Joseph Doherty, a Superior Court judge before whom I, I appeared countless times over the past semester as an intern in the Bridgeport Public Defender's Office. And though Judge Doherty is not a member of the faculty here, he's contributed immensely to my education. Judge Doherty is here today in his official capacity as father, celebrating the graduation of his daughter, Ashley. So I'd like to congratulate Ashley and the entire Doherty family. To my fellow classmates, it has been an honor to do this with you. Law school is an incredibly competitive environment, but that atmosphere here has always remained congenial, and that's because of our efforts. Many of the people who I now consider among my closest friends come from backgrounds and hold beliefs vastly different from my own. Your perspectives and the meaningful discussions we've had in hallways, at Calabash, and at Side Street shape this experience for me and help me realize the true meaning of common ground. Among many others, my good friend Jamie Belforti, whose prowess in a courtroom has earned him much deserving praise. Jamie will be a ferocious state's attorney, and I look forward with the hope that I get to try cases against him, of course, all ending in not guilty verdicts. <laughs> Colleen Kozik, my right-hand woman in the SBA, and one of my closest friends in the world. Mary Gamble, with whom I traveled to Chicago to represent our school at the ABA conference. Brittany Sanders, who somehow found the time to organize and run numerous events, including Barrister's Ball twice, while earning her JD and her MBA in just three years. Adam Shibley, whose incredible work ethic caused him to variously convert our shared SBA office into his private law review office <laughs> and a classroom where he tutored 1Ls in contracts. Zach Goldsmith, who I'm glad will be living in Brooklyn Heights next year and not in Crown Heights. Zach Ryland, who has the greatest defense attorney hair I've ever seen. And Jason Maurer, a veritable Chuck Norris of the, of the law. who notoriously kicked Vosberg. <laughs> and though I wish Jay luck with his tryout for Glee, the gain for that show's viewing audience would be a huge loss for the Connecticut legal community. Before I conclude, I'd just like to say a few words about this year's Professor of the Year, Professor William Dunlop. While Professor Dunlop's credentials are impressive, he has a BA from the New School for Social Research, an M. Phil from the University of Cambridge and a JD from Yale Law School. His, cur his curriculum vitae is not what makes Professor Dunlop Professor of the Year. That honor, chosen by the graduates of the class of 2010, is the result of less tangible credentials. His ability to convey his vast knowledge, to reach students, his sense of humor and good nature, and his dedication to his students. In my 1L criminal law class, Professor Dunlop was late only once, and we all waited. After five minutes, we began to talk. After 10 minutes, it had grown to a dull roar. And finally, after 15 minutes, 
Professor Dunlop finally burst through the door, dripping sweat, absolutely sweating through his shirt. We all went dead silent. His eyes were wild. We were waiting for a story about uh, escaping a carjacker or escaping from a wild animal. But in fact, Professor Dunlop had been here in this building on the treadmill. And he made one fatal error. He learned that day that you don't rely on an undergraduate for the time of day. <laughs> when Professor Dunlop finally got off the treadmill and saw his own watch, realized what time it was, he ran straight over without showering. And while I'm glad I wasn't in the front row of that class that day, I think it speaks to his dedication to his students and hopefully sheds a little bit of light on his deserving selection as Professor of the Year. Class of 2010, it's been an honor to be your classmate. I will forever consider myself fortunate for the opportunities I've had here and the relationships I've forged. As we go, as we go forward, we do so well equipped to pass the bar exam, to represent clients vigorously, ethically, and skillfully, and to make a positive impact on all that we touch. Congratulations, friends, and good luck. Keith, thank you very much. And uh, point of personal privilege, I, I, I want to express my thanks to you. Uh, we, we really depend on the Student Bar Association president to represent the students. And I depend on you um, to come to me, Kelly. I'll depend on you um, to let me know what students are concerned about, even if I don't want to hear it. Um, and I, you so graciously, vigorously represented students, but did so with the utmost professionalism and effectiveness. And I can assure all of you that Keith did yeoman's work for you, and I really appreciate it, Keith. Thank you. And as Keith really did some introductions for us for Professor Dunlap. The, the graduating class each year gets to select uh, one professor, deemed the outstanding professor, who will address the graduating class. That professor also will address the incoming class next year at orientation. And this is a coveted honor, um, as all of the graduating students know, and I suspect many faculty, uh, family members know. Um, the law school faculty is, is blessed with an extraordinary cadre of very effective and committed teachers. So to be selected as the outstanding teacher among a group that is this strong is a tremendous honor um, for a law school faculty member. And Professor Dunlap, we are very pleased to see you honored this way, and welcome. I am really happy to say I do not remember that treadmill incident. <laughs> so. Enough said. I'm very pleased to be up on the stage with Chief Justice Rogers and Judge Friedman. I've known Judge Friedman for more than three decades. In my first year of law school, I was in his seminar called Laws, Legislators, and Lobbyists, which I gather was sort of a one-semester version of the two-semester sequence he offers here with a semester of seminars followed by an internship or externship at the state capitol. And just eight years after that, Judge Friedman was instrumental in having me appointed reporter of the Legislative Task Force on Civil Liability better known as the Tort Reform Commission, uh, which was established by the legislature to help undo the damage I had done while helping the Judiciary Committee draft the products liability law. <laughs> so, what, one, one of the advantages of practicing law or teaching in a small state is that there are people who are out there who will give you a second chance. So. It's particularly gratifying to receive this recognition as Professor of the Year from, as Dean Saxton said, graduating students at a school that prides itself on teaching and on the relationship between the faculty and the students. It's not a quality you find at every law school. And I'm in good company up here, sharing the stage with previous recipients of the award, Dean King, Professor Ferrari, Professor Micklejohn. I hope I'm not forgetting anybody here. <laughs> I'm sorry, sorry, what was that? Oh, I'm sorry. 
Professor Farrell tells me he was Professor of the Year last year. So, sorry, Bob, who knew? Yeah. Yeah. It does help explain things, though, why Professor Farrell came barging into my office, as he does, uh, shortly after this year's award was announced. He was demanding to know how I, as chairman of the admissions committee, could admit a class four years ago that so recognized and appreciated superior teaching, and then the very next year admit a bunch of people who obviously have no idea what good teaching <laughs> is all about. So I will admit, in the interim, I learned how to pick them, and that would be you. And, and I assume that I'm standing up here because you wanted to thank me for letting you in here in the first place. So, you're welcome. And, uh, yeah, on the other hand, as you look around at the meltdown of the global economy and the chaos in the shrinking legal job market, thank you may not be exactly the phrase that's running through your mind right now. This is the legal profession's worst job market in decades. Everybody knows this, particularly undergraduates and pre-law advisors, but interestingly enough, it has not stopped people from applying to law schools. Applications are up, significantly higher. The marketplace, that great arbiter of ultimate truths in our society, still sees a legal education as a good investment. And this is a trend that's not unusual in a recession. College graduates realize they cannot get a job today as an investment banker or journalist or teacher or whatever, and that it's better to be in law school than to be unemployed. And in three or four years, they will be trained and licensed in a profession that is inevitably going to rebound and that has the potential of giving them far more satisfaction than the jobs they cannot get today. And now, for the very little bit of good advice you're gonna hear from me today. And I'll tell you right now, most of you won't want to take it, but it's worth contemplating. You may want to consider a comparable move. If you cannot find a job now, consider taking further training or an unpaid internship in a governmental or nonprofit organization. Consider an LLM in a specialty like tax or insurance or bankruptcy. There's a growth industry. An internship with the government or with an environmental or civil rights or social justice or peace organization can provide unparalleled experience and invaluable contacts. Most of them, of course, pay little or nothing, and an LLM can be expensive, but learning is better than sitting around waiting, and it looks a lot better on the resume. And think about doing it overseas or in an international context. Not only can an overseas LLM be much cheaper, even counting travel costs, but the legal profession is moving toward globalization. So international experience and transboundary perspectives can only help to kickstart a career. In short, try to make the best of a bad situation. Okay, relax, that's it for advice. Uh, except, <laughs> to repeat some that I gave a few of you two years ago when you were preparing for your criminal law and constitutional law exams. And speaking of globalization, and in the interests of full disclosure, proper citation, as we call it in law school, let me say that part of what you're about to hear is my own, tacked onto the end of my law school variation of Bob Blue's graduate school parody, of Paul Anka's adaptation, of Claude Francois and Jacques Raveau's 1960 French pop song called Comme d'habitude. I came, bought all my books, paid bills on time, followed directions. I worked, I studied hard, met lots of folks with good connections. I crammed, they gave me grades, and may I say, not in a fair way, <laughs> but more, much more than this, I did it their way. <laughs> The courses that I took were all required. I could not choose them. I learned all sorts of rules, although I knew I'd never use them. I found that to survive, it's best to write the doctrinaire way. And so I followed track and did it their way. 
Yes, there were times I wondered why I had to crawl when I could fly. I had my doubts, but after all, I clipped my wings and learned to crawl. I learned to bend, and in the end, I did it their <laughs> way. So, sorry. Yeah. You're not getting out of here nearly that early. I'll, I'll just try to lower it a little bit. And so, my fine young friends, now that I am a law professor, where once I was oppressed, I've now become the cruel oppressor. With me, you'll learn to thrive, you'll learn to climb law's golden stairway. But if, and only if, we do it their way. So it's up to you, cite a case or two, then follow track till your face turns blue. And if for you that's too routine, don't come to me, go see the dean. As long as they give me my pay, we'll do it their way. And now the end is near. But this is not the final curtain. As you march out from here, I'll tell you now one thing is certain. In those memos that you write, you'll follow track your every workday. And so, perhaps for years, you'll do it their way. But now the trouble is, it's not just track you need to follow. They'll tell you how to live to be a hale and well-met fellow. The object is to win. Don't worry much about the fair way. Go along to get along and do it their way. But it's up to you to make the choice, to live your life, to find your voice, to make your mark, to thrive somehow. We hope you'll be back years from now. We'll be so proud to hear you say, you did it your way. This isn't being recorded, is it? Yeah. Okay. Well, we're almost done here. Having spent more than half of my Quinnipiac career in the legal writing program, and the rest of the time being a pedant pointing out other people's mistakes, I can't resist leaving you with some wisdom that I'm sure you knew before you got here. But in any event, I certainly hope you learned it in your legal skills classes. You often hear it said that what matters most in a successful career, especially in law, is not what you know, but who you know. That's simply not right, and don't ever let the senior partner or the judge that you work for hear you say it. It's not who you know that counts, it's whom. <laughs> well. Well, you have friends to say goodbye to. I have exams to grade. <laughs> have a pleasant afternoon and have a great life. Thank you, Professor Dunlap, and there's not much that can top that. We are concluded. May I ask if, would everybody please stand and remain standing until the platform party and the class is recessed? Um, the reception will follow, and it is in the gymnasium that's at the end of the? Okay, so straight through the gymnasium that's on the right-hand side as you would exit the building on that side. 
But at this point, I'd like to call Rabbi Judd back to offer the benediction. Source of all mercy, be with these women and these men, bless them with guidance, let them be slow to anger. Let their eyes, their ears, and their hearts always and forever be open to the humanity of those before them. Dear new lawyers, let the righteousness within you be a source of pride to the world we share, the nation we live in, the communities of which you will become a part, the people who love you, and the strangers you will meet. Use your talents to do good and to give good. May the source of holiness bless you and protect you, forever fostering that which is within you to better fix and heal the world we share. Go with peace, go towards peace, create peace. Have a good one.